we will be in Second Peter again, uh, as well as in Jeremiah, so I'll, we can flip back and forth a little bit, but uh, I'll try not to lose you on the turns. Um, the Bible, this, there's actually the song, right? The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. Remember that one from Sunday school? I stand alone in the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Uh, it's a simple song, a short song, but a very powerful message. A message that says that we stand alone on God's word. That we place our life on the truth found in the word of God. You know, the Guinness Book of Records still it has the Bible as the best-selling book of all time. Estimated that there's been something like, five, you know, between five and seven billion, okay? So I know it's a big gap uh, of uh, Bibles that have been uh, printed. The full Bible translated in something like over 700 languages now and more all the time uh, and continuing to grow. So why is it relevant to us today? Well, for one, it has the answers to many of to life's greatest questions, right? Why do I exist? Does God exist? What's the meaning of all this? Why is there so much pain and suffering and how do I work through that? What happens when I die? Kind of questions that we wonder. And there are Bibles everywhere. Uh, there's Bible apps you can have on your phone. That maybe if you're using that even now, like in, and it reads to you. The Kids U version Bible app is a wonderful thing. It has interactive tools you can uh, the kids can interact with and learn. If you're looking for specific answers to specific questions, it's never been easier to find the answer to that. We can search easily, we can find things easily. And yet still, Bible literacy is still very, very low, even in the church. And granted, there are some pretty crazy things, if you read through the Bible, that have happened. It's like, wow, that is incredible. Like, the bear mauls the kids, and like, what the, what's that all about? You know, it's like, there are a lot of really kind of crazy things. But God's word has purpose. This week in Second Peter... We're going to see the value of God's word. Remember, this series is about solid ground, standing firm on the solid ground. And Peter, as he's writing these letters, he's dealing with false teaching. There are things that are coming into the church that are causing people to start to waver a bit. And in order to combat false teaching, you need to know what's true. So the big idea for us today is this, that God's word is truth worth standing upon. Uh, as we read this, I want to explore why. And I hope that it gives you something to think about, to grow in, to explore, especially if you are kind of not so sure. Like you may be a little kind of doubts on what is true and what's not true. So let me read this, and we'll go from there. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon be put, a, put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses. Of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard the voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to keep your place there. And I want to give you an example. We're going to go back to Jeremiah. I'll put this on the screen, but if you want to go back to Jeremiah chapter 23. And here is an example of, a, of kind of how this plays played out. 
He says this, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from one another. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, declares the Lord. Behold, I'm against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tells them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness when I did not send them or charge them. So they do not profit the people at all, declares the Lord. So what do we notice to start with? We notice confusion and chaos. They had people in the Jeremiah text who were calling themselves prophets, declaring things that God had supposedly told them that God had not told them. Okay, One prophet has a dream, God told me this, God told me that, and God didn't tell them any of it. And people buy it without any sense of caution. And that's what happened here. People were just buying it. Without any sense of like, oh, you say you're a prophet? Very good, we'll listen to you. And without any sort of testing. It's kind of like all those scams you see, you know, you're not going to get rich by a Nigerian prince who's going to give you a fortune, right? I mean, that's, that's not going to happen, probably, to most of you. Uh, I, if I give gift cards to this person overseas, I'm not going to get some sort of investment out of that deal, right? It, it's, it's, but yet people fall for it all the time. We need truth. We do that by knowing and obeying God's word. We understand that this is true. In all other areas of our life, if I have a paper due for a class I'm taking and I wait until the, the day of to start it and I have to rush to get it done and I don't make the deadline, or maybe I do, but it's very poorly done, I have known but not really obeyed, right? I have not really applied the knowing to doing. And that's how it is with God's word. We, it's not enough just to know it. We need to apply it and obey it. So there are three descriptions for us today from both of these texts that I want to look at as far as what God's word is. And the first one is this. God's word is unchanging. And therefore, all of life must be filtered through it. We do this all the time. We filter our wor- life through our worldview. How we view the world, we filter it through that. And I grew up in southeastern Wisconsin, and so I filter you know, what counts as cheese and sausage, different than some of you might, or, uh, you know, football teams, different than you might. Um, I did follow the Timberwolves, by the way, and I feel, I feel the pain of the Minnesota sports fan. You know, like, it's, it's a real deal, but anyway. Even more, as a follower of Jesus, our worldview really ought to dictate how we think, how we behave, what our decisions, ideas are, our, our mind and our emotions will deceive us. You know, the common mantra out there is just follow your heart, right? Just do what feels good, whatever kind of floats your boat, if you will. The problem with that is I can't be trusted to make the right choice on my own. Jeremiah talked about this earlier. The heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately sick, desperately wicked. Who can understand it? So I don't think we want to follow our heart, right? That's not going to lead us in a good place. It'll get us into trouble if we don't filter through the word of God into our life. And so then we need to understand then what is true and what is not true. What did God actually say? What does God say about me and my life and my experience? You know, if you walk around feeling defeated and and broken down, you're not alone. A lot of people feel that way, especially if you've kind of dealt with some really tough things. And maybe you've felt the burden and the weight of sin on your life and You feel like, oh man, I just keep messing this up. God gives me a rule and I break the rule and he's just going to just punish me. I'm just randomly placed here and I'm just, I'm not significant, I'm not important, I have no purpose. But if we filter that through God's word, we get a different picture, right? This is 
Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. That sounds like a God who cares about you, doesn't it? A God who knows you. He wants to know your heart and wants to be involved. Hems you in. Watches over your coming and your going. You see, the word of God changes how we view these things. We filter it through his word. Brother Lawrence, who was a 17th century, like a religious monk of some sort, I don't remember exactly, but there's some writings of his. And one of the things in the book, Practicing the Presence of God, he says the more we know him, the more we will desire to know him. Think about that. The more we know him, the more we desire to know him. As love increases with knowledge, the more we know God, the more we will truly love him. As we uncover who he is, we become more in love with him. We learn to love him more. And then he says we learn to love him equally in times of distress or times of great joy. So where does that view come from? It comes from the word of God, that we know who he is. We know that he is faithful and true and that he is working in us. You see, God looks at what's going on in the book of Jeremiah and that whole scene of the prophets kind of making all kinds of claims. And he sees what's being taught and he calls them out on it and says, there is an agenda here and it's not from God. And so we're told to test all things. In verse 29 it says, is not my word like fire, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? If the word is like fire, give it the fire test. Does it burn in the fire? Give it the hammer test. Can you break it with the hammer of God's word? Or does it stand up under the test? You see, just because someone smart said it doesn't make it true. There are plenty of skeptics, plenty of reasons for skepticism. I keep seeing these videos on social media of like these Christian, allegedly, I don't know, Christian groups uh, and the, the things that they're preaching, it's just nonsense. It's not even scriptural. And uh, one, one guy said that he, I think he had like a vision, and he said that in his vision, he was Jesus asked him to forgive him. And I was like, well, wait, wait, wait. wait. Jesus, you're asking Jesus? Jesus is asking you to forgive him? That doesn't make any sense. That's not what the Bible says at all about who he is. And so it's confusing. People are confused. You need to understand what the Bible says. He says to speak the word faithfully. Ground yourself in what we know to be true. Be faithful to it. The word of God is unchanging, and we filter our life and our emotions and our opinions through it. It's also uncompromising. The biggest complaint that you see God has against the prophets here is that they speak for him without speaking anything he would say or had said. Right? God said this. Don't you hate that when people do that? Like they say, like, oh, he said that, and I never said that. I had somebody this week say something about something I supposedly said, and I said, I never said anything like that. What are you talking about? It's frustrating when people misquote you. But Peter writes in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, <clears throat> he says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along. And so be faithful to speak it. It's hard sometimes. We don't always like it, right? Because it bothers us. It messes with us. But we need to speak what he says. See, what they were doing was going before the people and just saying, like, hey, and even in first in second Peter, same thing. Hey, this is what God said, and just follow along. But they weren't standing in the counsel of God. God says, if you stood in my presence and asked me, I would have told you what to say. But you didn't ask. Instead, you just wagged your tongues and, and said things and made claims. And as a result, God says he is firmly positioned against them. But God's word is uncompromising. So we can be confident to uphold it. The word of God brings results in our life. It brings growth in our lives. It changes us. 
It's also irreplaceable. It's irreplaceable. We are potentially led astray by counterfeits. And, and I've done this, I've said this before, where I've, I've taken Bible verses and like song lyrics and put them up and, and which one's true and people get confused. Ideas that run counter to God's word lead people astray. The word of God rightly proclaimed will lead us to encounter Jesus. Counterfeits look similar, but they're different. Uh, we, I don't know, some of you are maybe into this. We went uh, outside a backyard and we found one of those morel mushrooms, just one, right? Some of you may go out and like harvest these things and search for them and like climb through the woods and all that. Apparently they're like a delicacy, right? They, the people like really like them and eat them and make all kinds of dishes. So we're looking this up. I'm looking this up and I, I harvest this one. <laughs> just, and uh, we eat it. And I'm looking this up and apparently there are counterfeit Morels out there, right? And like, you better know you're getting the right one. And so I'm like, I'm making sure, like, and I saw some pictures of, of other ones and they're close, but there's a little bit, you know, kind of off. And if you eat the wrong one, you get sick, very sick. Uh, you know, and it's kind of like that, right, with, with, with the counterfeit stuff we get in the Word. Uh, not in the Word, but from others who say it's in the Word, I should say. We need to know what the real thing says. We need to understand what it is. And so we use this as a lie detector. Like, okay, here's our standard. And like, here's what it looks like. Here's what it says. And so what is, what is being told to me? It's, it's a counterfeit. It's not true. Or does it fit in there? Look at the real thing. So for the remaining time, I want to just hit for a second on some of the things that we put into this as to why we believe what we believe. And maybe if you've never really thought about the Bible before, here's a couple things to think about. Because uh, some people maybe haven't read it in years or ever. And so here's an opportunity for you to say, maybe I should dig into this. Paul, Peter says that we're not following cleverly invented stories. Like we didn't just make this up as like some way to control people. The Bible is Old Testament and New Testament. Old Testament meaning covenant, New Testament, New Covenant. Old Testament written before Jesus came and walked on earth and ministered. There's 39 books of the Old Testament, law, prophecy, psalms, poetry. The first five books are called the Pentateuch. They have the Hebrew law. There's some history books. There's some poetic stuff, minor and major prophets, and not in importance, but in size. Like some books are very small. Some are very big. The New Testament has 27 books, starting with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They tell us the story of Jesus, his ministry on earth, and his death and resurrection the salvation that he bought for us. The book of Acts talked about the early church and how the move of God went and, and people, the message spread and people were saved. And, and then you have the letters of Paul and some other letters in there as well and the book of Revelation, which is prophecy. And the most interesting thing, I think, about the Bible in terms of its unity is that the theme of the entire scriptures is Jesus Christ. It's true. Look it up. Look at it. Everything in the Old Testament points to the Messiah to come. Points to Jesus who is coming. And then in the New Testament, it refers to what he's accomplished on the cross for us. And there is unity there. Even though there's like 35 different authors, and over the course of 100, 150 years, there's harmony in what is being said. And the reason is, is because of what Peter wrote here, because the prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. Now, there's a few other things to think about in our life as we determine whether or not to believe in the Word of God. Uh, the Bible is unlike any other book that's ever been written. And it, actually, if you didn't know this, the printing press actually was kind of dreamed up and motivated by the desire to print the Bible. Uh, and to produce copies of it. Now, people will tell me, and maybe they've told you, like, how do you believe that old book? It's got a lot of errors in it. You know, it's all these things that they tell you. Interesting thing is that while it's been copied many, many times, it is the most accurately transmitted book that's ever been written. There's a lot of, a lot of things there. You can look this up. There's a lot out there on this. 
but by the standard of scholarly occurrence and reliability, the Bible stands above all other literature, like far above. Peter says here that they're eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses are the best kind of witnesses. There's no better one than that. And that they saw with their own eyes when they wrote this and they were telling this story and people in the room, like, I was there. And that's not how that happened. They would have changed, this. They would have changed it. So the New Testament was written such a close period of time between when it happened and when it was written. People were alive. They're eyewitnesses and they saw it and they experienced it. Another interesting fact, just last thing on that, and you can look up more, hoping it's kind of wetting your appetite for that, if you're really interested, is that there are 332 prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, using, this is interesting, using mathematical science of probability, a man named Peter Stone, an academic in mathematics, so, you know, smart person, said the odds of a person fulfilling even eight of them is 1 in 10 to the 17th power. So a number kind of like that. The probability of someone doing 48 of them is 1 to the 157th power. And the number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the 80th power. So you get an idea that there is... A, there, and that's just for 48. Now, 332. It's a lot to explore there. And I know there's a lot more to, to say Historical accuracy is another one that comes up in that you can find in historical documents that are not biblical the story of Jesus. You can hear about his followers. Like, it works. It's congruent. It works together. It, it, it's not a made-up story. But yet it's constantly under attack. The person of Jesus Christ is verifiable. And, and really the biggest way that you grasp this for yourself is by reading it. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that uh, the, it's living and active, sharper than double-edged sword. It divides thoughts and emotions. And so you know when you read the word and you kind of put yourself in a position to receive it that you start to become judged by it because it is God's holy word for us. So the scripture does that for us when you read it and interact with it. So God's word is worth standing upon. And all of this, like I said, points to the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And we celebrate that this morning at the table as we come in just a few minutes. Remembering what Jesus did. Understanding that, that there was a, a great need that we all had for our sins to be forgiven. And for many years, they used sacrifice, animal sacrifice, uh, put the sins on the you know, animal and sacrifice that, and that was to satisfy the wrath of God, but it was not perfect and complete until Jesus came, and he is the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb, the one who was slain on our behalf and rose to new life so that we can know him, we can attach ourselves to him, and we can have life in him. And that's the good news of the entire scriptures, is that he has come, he has died for our sins, he has risen again, and he will come again. And so as we come to our time at the table, the question for you is, do you believe? Is this your profession of faith? Do you, do you really trust in Jesus for your salvation, for your life? And if you do, and you have for a long time, that's great. Celebrate that. If you have not, today perhaps is a day when you say, you know what, I really want to know him. I really want to trust him. I really want to put my life in him, to understand that the, there is something bigger than me, right? There's something bigger than just my ideas going on. There is a God who, who loves me and has a plan and purpose in my life. So I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Lord, as we come...